Please join me in a prayer for God's wisdom and understanding. Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, we ask that you grant us wisdom and understanding. May our time spent in your word grow in us love for you and your people and bring you glory. Amen. Our unison reading today comes from Psalms, uh, chapter 138. This can be found in your pew Bible in the Old, T- Old Testament, page 577. This is a psalm of praise and thanksgiving, praising God for God's faithful attention in response to the psalmist's needs. Note the repeated pattern. The psalmist praises attributes about God. He lists examples of God's responses. God regards the lowly, the needy. The people respond with thankful praises for help received. Please join with me as we read Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose in me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. That can be found in your pew Bible in New Testament, page 72. Jesus teaches what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. The version in Luke's Gospel is shorter than the version in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew adds, Thy will be done, and, but deliver us from evil. The Lord's Prayer is followed by two paragraphs about petitionary prayer, asking and seeking. And Jesus assures us that God hears and responds to our prayers with proper answers. We may need to force family and friends to respond to our needs, but God is always ready to hear our needs and to respond. So ask, seek, and knock. Please follow along as I read Luke 11, 1 through 13. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me, The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So we're in the stewardship season, and stewardship season prompts jokes about ministers and money. For instance, a man called the church one day and said to the secretary who answered the phone, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. She, she said, who? I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. Now realizing she had heard him correctly, she said, sir, if, if you're talking about our minister, you've got to have a little more respect and ask for the pastor or, or reverend, but not the head hog at the trough. Oh, I see. Well, well, I had $50,000 I wanted to give to the building fund. Secretary, hold on, sir. I think the big pig just walked in the door. <laughs> Stewardship, church finances, they're fodder for jokes. But every once in a while, you have those stories that are really endearing stories. In her stewardship blog this past week, Lindsay Lexi Steinley shared what she learned from her parents about giving gifts, and she remembers as a little girl going to the store to buy birthday presents for her parents, and they would take her, and she said, as an excited child, I searched up and down every aisle looking for the perfect shirt or a trinket or a treat or something or another, dragging my parent in tow as I went through the whole store looking for the perfect thing. And then when I found it, the, what I thought would top all gifts, we would check out, and then I would eagerly await getting to wrap it and present it that I had poured so much love into it with a gift tag that read, to mom, to dad, love, Lexi. And as an adult, she said, looking back, I now realize, as excited as I was to give the gift from me, I was not the one who paid for it. Mom or dad from their own bank account paid for their own gift. And even if I had been given an allowance with which to buy it, it was still their money. It just added a step between the giving and the receiving. The money still would have come from my parents. So why did my parents allow me to gift them with what was already theirs? Because they loved me enough to teach the importance and the act of giving joyfully from the heart. Lexi's parents were receiving what was really already theirs if they bought it. Just like when we give to God, we're already giving back to God what is already God's. He, God appreciates our offerings because God knows that we have learned how to give from the heart, how to give joyfully, how to give out of concern for other people, how to recognize a gift from God that we might share with other people, and how we live consciously in God's abundance for us. He's entrusted each of us with time, with talents, with finances, with influence, with connections, with resources, with everything we need to do God's work. And we're simply giving back in thanks to God to say, I want to be a part of what you are doing. Thank you, God. Your daughter was exactly right when you pray. You open your heart to God first, and then you start to say thank you. You're teaching her well. Stewardship, as I said last week, is not just about the gift. It's also about the giver, about the motive, about the love behind it. It's, it's the model we've been given by Jesus, even as he taught us how to pray and how of his own generosity what he did for others. We learn by example and by repeating what we see and hear others doing. And in his Lord prayer and then the parables that follow, Jesus talks about the significance, how to pray and how to trust that God will then answer and provide what it is you need. At the conclusion of that famous prayer from St. Francis, we hear, for it is in giving that we are blessed. It is in giving that we receive. In managing what we give, may we show the same love and excitement of a little girl picking out a birthday present for a parent to say, I love you, I thank you. May we lavish love and appreciation on those that, whom we share our gifts just as Jesus did, and because we're grounding our stewardship in the heart of God. Our readings about prayer give meaning also into stewardship and meeting others' needs as God meets our needs daily. The Lord's Prayer shows us what to pray, and the parable of the persistent knocker afterwards tells us that God will indeed answer your prayers. Let's reverse the order and look at the parable first. 
this parable of the persistent knocker where a friend unexpectedly shows up and his host invites him to stay the night and as families bake bread for each day and only enough for the day, now the host is in a bind because his pantry is empty and he doesn't have anything to share with his guest. And he cannot fulfill the sacred obligation of hospitality, so what is he to do? What is, what is he to do? And he, he doesn't want folks talking about his family as the one who refused to feed their guests when they come, so he goes next door to think perhaps they have something to share, so he goes to his neighbor in the midnight, says the family are all asleep, the cows and chickens, the goats, they're all asleep on the lower floor of the Palestinian home while the, the family's on the upper level. And the man knocks on the door, and the husband whispers to his wife, pretend you're asleep. Maybe he'll go away. The man knocks again, louder. The child wakes up. Mommy, who's that at the door? Dad moans, we've all gone to bed. Don't bother us. The man knocks again. Now the chickens are awake. Now the cows are awake. There's a ruckus, and he knows he's not going to get back to sleep. And so finally he says, well, now you've done it. Who is it? It's your neighbor. It's me, Bubba. Oh, good grief. So will the man get up and help him? Of course he will. With their sacred duty of hospitality, and none of Jesus' listeners would imagine the man wouldn't get up. So when Jesus asked his point very pointedly, Suppose one of you, and the answer is emphatic, of, of course I'd get up. With that, Jesus drives home his point. If the grouchy neighbor is going to respond to his friend's request, how much more will our loving God respond to our request? The parable is really not the, about the persistent knocker. It's about the homeowner. This parable is not about us. It's, it's about God. It's not a pep talk advising, keep, keep bugging God, keep persisting, keep uh, bugging God until he finally he'll give you what you want. Rather, we're to pray persistently so that we understand that what God wills for us. God knows our needs better than what we think is right for us. And sometimes the answer seems slow in coming because we're not prepared for the right answer. God knows what is best, and so God will answer our prayers and grant what we ask, but not always in the way that we ask, because sometimes God answers yes, sometimes no, not that, sometimes not yet, and sometimes not that, but something better. It's not because he refuses to answer us as if he doesn't hear us, but because he has something better for us. If you've looked at the stewardship bulletin insert, it says on the front that stu on the back, stewardship is the trust that God will always provide what we need. And if you read carefully down below, it then says to be good stewards, we need to understand that God is the source of all that we have and a good and generous provider giving us the greatest gift of all, the Holy Spirit, to transform us and to guide us into the kingdom. The Holy Spirit, it says, our source of wisdom and faith gives us the, pray, the power to pray the Lord's Prayer and to mean it, the power to trust in God to provide, and the power to find contentment in what is given. The Holy Spirit is our compass to direct us, not only in our prayer but also our entire lives toward God's kingdom. Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, not as this is the way you beg God, but to help us to discover the insights and blessings that come because you pray this prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, we have a personal God, personal relationship with God, but God who is also the Almighty One, the ancients of days in the heavens, uh, the first, the last, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the sovereign one, the transcendent one, the radiant God of the universe is also your Father. You may freely and confidently approach Him. Just as we say when we confess our sins, God stands ready to forgive us and remove any barriers so you don't have to be afraid to come before Him. Jesus even said, pray to Him as Daddy, personal. 
hallowed be thy name. What does hallowed mean? Holy, made holy, revered, to be respected. Before asking anything, we have to give glory to God to acknowledge God. We pay tribute. We remind ourselves the proper order. God comes first, then our needs. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're not just asking for the return of Jesus at the end of time, but really praying that your, your royal law of love your neighbor, your royal order of things might rule in our hearts and our world today. We are praying that people will submit themselves to God and to do God's will as readily and as perfectly as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Remember the parable? Loaves, cook three loaves for the day for the family's needs. Provide for my needs this day, and I'll trust you for tomorrow. We live in a daily dependence on God, and we seek to obey God's will one day at a time. And we're not to worry about the unknown of tomorrow, because God will supply our needs tomorrow too. Even Jesus said, let the worries of tomorrow take care of themselves. You focus on today. And we can enjoy the blessings of tomorrow, too, because we'll know the blessings of today. And may we also give bread to others. May we provide for their needs daily. Forgive us our debts, for we ourselves forgive everyone else indebted to us. We're not talking about money. We're talking about trespasses, our sins. Forgive us anything that leads us indebted obligated, obliged to ask for forgiveness or to make things right. And we, may we do it as readily as we forgive others who trespass against us. Forgive us for doing things that obligate us to ask forgiveness, which leave us indebted to somebody else's good graces. Our forgiving others is not the ground of God's forgiveness of us. Forgiveness springs from God's grace, not from our own merit. We love God because God first loved us. We forgive others because God first forgave us and freed us to do that, to remove the barriers that are between us and others. So we can confidently approach a merciful God. Lead us not into temptation, and in essence, and, but do not bring us to the time of trial. God doesn't cause us to be tempted. Satan tempts us. Satan's good at it. Satan will do anything to mislead us and to steal us away from God, to woo us away from God. We cannot escape temptation, but with God we can resist temptation and not be overcome by it. Our will is strong, but the flesh is weak. And it's weak against Satan's power. So we pray to be delivered from evil, literally the evil one. Do not let us be tested and overcome by this God. Deliver us from the evil one. And if we live out that Lord's Prayer each and every day as our daily bread, if we live by the teachings of Jesus, we will be come loving and gracious, even as our God is loving and gracious. We'll become forgiving toward others will become generous toward others just as God is generous toward us. And we would, would not withhold the bread that we have if someone else needs it. Such living goes against the grain of our permissive society indeed, and it's difficult. But the Christian life is tough, but it's worth it, is it not? Because is it not good when we do it right? To me, that's where the parable of the persistent knocker helps. Living the Christian life is difficult, but God is ready and willing to come to our aid, and if the grouchy homeowner will give up what his neighbor needs, how much more will our loving God respond to us? If human parents, faulty and sinful as we are, will not deceive our children, giving them a serpent or a scorpion, instead of the food that they need, how much more will our loving God give us what we need? even when we don't know that's really what we need. He gives what is right. 
So if you aspire to be more generous, not just in your finances, but in your time and your effort and your compassion for other people, spend more time attending to your prayer life. Generosity at its finest involves your relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you grow closer to Jesus, you have more compassion for his people. You start to pay attention to the needs of others of God's people. And the Holy Spirit, who is that prayer language, that prayer connection, God's answering you, developing you, reveals what you can do to help and when and where and how you might help. It it quickens your heart, expands your mind to understand what are the talents and the gifts and the influence you have to do good for others. And you have enough for today, and you have resilience to begin tomorrow. Because stewardship is really loving and caring for other people. It is showing respect for those who are in need, whose need we can meet, providing them daily bread. So your Lord's Prayer is your conversation with God that deepens your relationship with Christ. And you honor your Creator and you offer yourself as an act of generosity into God's divine plan That generosity coincides with the gifts God has given you. Give us this day our daily bread. And help us to give bread to others. God's ready to give good gifts, but we have to do our part by being ready to receive them and asking for them. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Maybe the answer is yes, maybe no, maybe not yet, maybe not that, something better. But always, God will answer. Amen and amen. God, it's all that easy, isn't it? Oh, but it's all that hard. Help us then to trust you and to love others. In your holy name, amen.